I remember growing up studying U.S. history in school. The history of our country was taught with a certain sense of inevitability. The way the story was played out, the way it was taught, it was pretty much like watching an old western where the good guys wear white hats and the bad guys wear black hats. Only in this story, the good guys wore mostly common clothing, mostly brown, and the bad guys wore red coats. And the bad guys, as they were portrayed, were one-dimensional. As one-dimensional as any movie character, any movie villain, we really didn't learn very much about them at all except that they were the bad guys. Their realities weren't complex. They didn't have crises of conscience. They didn't have families to go home to. They didn't have personal interests. They were as faceless as any Star Wars stormtrooper. And as people, as individuals, we didn't take them any more seriously than Mulroy and Murtaugh, the two bumbling British soldiers from the Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy, who in real life are Angus Barnett and Giles New, or their counterparts, Pintle and Rigetti, who in real life are Lee Ehrenberg and Mackenzie Crook. You know, it was the same in this story for our heroes. People like George Washington and Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams. They were lionized, but ironically treated with the same kind of disregard as the villains were treated in regard to who they actually were. Now, we rightly hold these men in high regard, but for too long, we held them in such high esteem that we believed every good thing we heard about them and disregarded any bad thing we heard about them because it didn't fit our paradigm, didn't fit our way of thinking. And by handling their stories in that way, we frankly treated them with as much contempt as we treated the villains in the story because we robbed them of their individuality. We robbed them of their identities. We robbed them of us knowing who they actually were as people. We took away their realness. Now more recently, in the past 25 years or so, the pendulum has swung the other way. And too many histories have come out attempting to tear down those idols. And these new histories, these revised histories, many of our national heroes are portrayed just as poorly, just as one-dimensionally, only now they're caricatured as rich, white, hateful, racist, sexist, lecherous, land-hungry, genocidal, hypocritical, double-dealing scapegraces. And when it comes to their religious beliefs, well, those are downplayed as much as possible, set to the margin as much as possible as to what the Founding Fathers believed. There's only one thing that everyone seems to know or that everyone thinks they know about the Founding Fathers and their religious beliefs, and people repeat it like Muppets mouthing the words. They were deists. Our founding fathers, they were all deists. They didn't really believe in God. They believed in a God who wound up the universe and let it run like a top. But it wasn't really God like we understand God. And it wasn't a personal faith. So they weren't really Christian, but they were deists. Well, first of all, nonsense. The evidence that our founding fathers et al. were deists is scant at best. That's an assumption based on the very little information any of them give about their faith in what are mostly secular documents. I mean, think about it. Think about the paper that you've generated in your lifetime. Think about the things that you've written for school and for work. Your letters, your correspondence, your emails, the ones you actually write, not the ones that you just receive and forward on to other people. If everything you've written in your lifetime were stacked up, and 200 years from now, a historian were looking at that, how much would they really know about your faith from that? Is the name of Jesus constantly on your lips? Is the name of Jesus constantly on the tip of your pen? Mine neither, frankly. And the name of Jesus wasn't constantly on the lips of our founding fathers, or constantly on the tips of their pens either. They didn't pepper their daily discourse with a lot of Jesus talk. However, what the evidence of their lives actually suggests to me is that the Founding Fathers were men of faith. And that as most Christians of their day, they took Christianity as a given. Because there were no competing theologies that were really presenting themselves in the United States at that time. These were enlightened men, educated statesmen, politicians, 
who didn't wear their faith on their shirt sleeves, as a majority of Christians don't today. And as a majority of their intellectual peers at the time. And as a majority of their peers, they had a little too much confidence in the technology of their day. They had a little too much confidence in the scientific discoveries of their day. And they had a little too much confidence in humankind, in human beings, and our ability and our proclivity to create heaven on earth, to do good things, to perfect the world, to create something like paradise on earth. But that doesn't make them deists. And it doesn't make them secular humanists either. What it does make them is very similar to a great many Christians today. What it does is it makes them very similar to a great many politicians today who check the box Christian when they fill out an information form. Those politicians, for the most part, aren't lying. They're not unbelievers. However, they do live out their Christianity in ways that perhaps to us, as conservative evangelicals, can sometimes seem nominal, can sometimes seem marginal. However, that's a judgment on my part. That's just based on what I can actually observe in other people. You see, in our tradition in the Church of Christ, we have a tendency to view our Christianity, our faith, as the whole matrix, as the whole loom on which we weave our lives. But to a great many Christians, Christianity is but one ingredient in a balanced human life. It's an indispensable ingredient, but to many Christians it is still but one element in a whole life, in a balanced life. And many Christians are more than happy to avoid the criticism that Paul gave the Athenians in Acts 17.22, that they were too religious. That doesn't mean their Christianity is dubious. It only means that the way they live into their Christianity is somewhat foreign to our way of thinking. So, while it's easy to dismiss the Christianity of our founding fathers as deism, I think that at best is an oversimplification. People are more complex than that. And this is important. This is important to remember whenever you consider the debate, whenever you consider the question that's been going on for years now, and it's the question to which today's message is addressed. And that is, whether or not, or the degree to which, the United States is a Christian nation. The answer to that question won't be found in the Founding Fathers' business correspondence. It isn't a matter of the degree to which the Founding Fathers made their faith public. It isn't even a matter of whatever kind of dirt you can dig up on the Founding Fathers. It isn't a matter of how many slaves any of them owned or impregnated. It isn't a matter of whether or not the Founding Fathers had sin in their lives. The Founding Fathers were sinners. Take my word for it. But, the degree to which the United States can properly be considered a Christian nation isn't up to the Founding Fathers. At least not anymore. It doesn't depend on them. The answer to the question, are we a Christian nation, isn't based on the righteousness of the Founding Fathers. The answer to that question is based on your righteousness. The answer to that question is up to you. To what degree can the United States of America properly be considered a Christian nation? That's entirely up to us. In the same way that that question has been entirely up to every generation of Americans, back to and including the first generation. You know, Thomas Jefferson was a wise man. And he knew that that question was something that could only be measured from the ground up, not from the top down. That question can't be answered in terms of our perception of the degree to which God has blessed this nation. God sends the rain to fall on the good and the evil alike. And sometimes God blesses manifestly ungodly peoples in order to carry out his will. And Jefferson knew that. And he revealed his understanding of that in the opening words of the Declaration of Independence when in the course of human 
events. Because you see, the establishment of this sovereign nation was a human event. Now yes, the powers that be are ordained by God. But God doesn't govern nations. God appoints people to do that. And God doesn't force the people that he appoints to be godly. That's up to them. There's no sense in which any nation is Christian by divine fiat, or by divine appointment, or by manifest destiny. A nation may be properly identified as a Christian nation only in relationship to the degree to which its leaders and its citizens seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. A nation can only be considered a Christian nation to the degree that its leaders and its citizens participate in the divine nature through grace. A nation can only be considered a Christian nation in regard to the degree to which its leaders and its citizens take up their crosses daily and follow Christ. Because the cross is also a human event. And the Founding Fathers, by all appearances, understood that as well. This is evident not only in the opening words of the Declaration of Independence, but more importantly in the closing words. Jefferson, it appears, understood that what he and the Founding Fathers were about to undertake, what they were about to do, was a very human event. And that the lives, the real lives, of real people would be profoundly affected. Some for the better, some for the worse, whether they succeeded or not. And he also knew, as did all of the signers of the Declaration, apparently, that the best hope for this enterprise to succeed was in the imitation of Christ. Really? Really? The Founding Fathers were sinners. That's a given. They were flawed men. But they were also fathers. They were also men who took action based on belief, sustained by confidence in God. That's what faith is. Faith isn't something that we think. Faith is something that we do. The English word believe is made up of two words. It's a compound word. It's made up of two words. Be and leave. Be meaning to exist or to live. And leave or leaf indicating the will or what is willed. And we're not saved for having a certain opinion about God. We're saved for living what is willed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithing isn't something that we think, it's something that we do. It's action based on belief sustained by confidence in God. And the fact that the signers of the Declaration of Independence understood this is evidence in the fact that they not only affixed their names to that declaration, but they manifestly lived into its words, particularly its closing words. And what were those words? With a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledged to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. The establishment of the United States of America was a human event. But it was a human event that was deliberately and resolutely placed under the sovereignty of God. A nation becomes identified as a Christian nation by virtue of the degree to which its leaders and its citizens, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, mutually pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to that end. That's what Christ did toward us in his human event, the cross. The cross is the most human event God has ever undertaken. And at the cross, Christ, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, pledged to the Father his life, his fortune, 
and his sacred honor. And in obedience to the Father, he submitted all of these to us. And it's with that in mind that we approach the table of the Lord today. Because before we can consecrate our nation to the Lord, we must first consecrate ourselves. Second Chronicles 7, 14 If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. There's a sequence here. First we consecrate ourselves to the Lord. Then he makes us holy. Then he heals our land. We consecrate ourselves to the Lord first in baptism, but we renew that consecration week after week at the table of the Lord. And what does that consecration involve? Fundamentally, that consecration involves three things. Our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. That's what Christ consecrated to us. And at this table, the table of the Eucharist, the table of good grace gifts, we both receive and give all of these. Starting with our sacred honor. Jesus said in Mark 9.12, It is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. Well, suffer what things, specifically? Well, pain and agony, right? Well, yes. I mean, of course, there's no doubt that the physical pain that Jesus suffered and the passion hurt like mad fury. However, the Bible, even though it reports Jesus' beatings and flogging and crucifixion without flinching, actually says very little about the physical pain involved in these events. What it does dwell on, however, is the shame that Christ suffered in these events. You see, not only did Christ give up equality with God when he became human, but in the Passion, Christ was stripped even of his human dignity. And he was subjected to the ravages of shame. And shame was new for him. He had never experienced shame before because he had never experienced guilt before. But having subjected his life to us, and having taken our guilt upon himself, we subjected him to shame. But not just the shame of our guilt, but the shame of nakedness, insult, scorn, and derision. He was not only stripped of his clothing and made the object of our burlesque, but his body was invaded, insulted with fists and boots, sputum, thorns, whips, nails, and a sword. But Jesus, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, pledged his sacred honor to us. And in the Passion, he made good on that pledge. And at this table, we receive the body of Christ, and so we receive the redemption of our bodies. We receive the body of Christ and by his wounds we are healed. We receive the body of Christ and so also receive his shame. John 15, 18 and following. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. But as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. At this table we renew our pledge to Christ that he may do as he wishes with our sacred honor. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Luke 9, 23. And what does it mean? To deny yourself and take up your cross? 
I think it means many things, but one of the things it means is that we agree to suffer in whatever ways Christ ordains. Now for us in this country, the 21st century, right now, it doesn't look like for most of us that's going to include physical pain or physical death because of the name of Christ, although it did include that for many Christians for the first 300 years of the Christian enterprise, and it still does for Christians all around the world today. For us, it appears that what we will suffer for the name of Christ is shame. The world hates God and hates His ways. The era of domestic tranquility for Christians, at least for the time being in this nation, appears to be behind us. And if you love God and love His ways, the world will hate you. And you will become the object of their burlesque. There too, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faithing, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Christ didn't love his shame, he scorned it. And we don't have to love our shame either, but we do have to endure it. That's our pledge. That having received in our bodies the grace, the life of God that will redeem our bodies, we will also do as Paul says in Romans 12, 1, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let us pray. Lord, before this table and before these witnesses, we mutually pledge our bodies to you as you have pledged your body to us. Hear our prayer, O Lord, and grant us your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Secondly, we pledge our lives. According to Genesis 9, life is in the blood. That's where the human spirit resides, in the blood, in the cardiovascular system, in our bodies, in our blood, in our heart, in our cardia. Human beings are dichotomous. We're made up of two fundamental elements. We are bodies and we are spirits. And our spirits are in our blood. Jesus' spirit was in his blood too. That's where his human spirit resided, for Jesus was fully human when he was here on earth. And when he shed his blood, he shed his life. But not just his human life, his divine life as well. Human beings are made up of two elements, but Christ was made up of three. He was a human body. He was a human spirit. But he was also full of grace. And grace is the living spirit of God. And when Christ shed his blood, he shed his life, his whole life. With a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, he pledged his life to us. That's the spiritual gift that we receive in salvation. That's the spiritual gift which is renewed week after week here in the fruit of the vine. The life of God, which is grace, living in us. And it's here that we renew our pledge week by week. That the very breath of life that sustains us, the very Spirit of God that indwells us, the Spirit which He pledged to us on the cross, will not be grieved in us, but will be glorified in us. For the Father is glorified in the Son, John 13, 31, and the Son is glorified in us, John 17, 10. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6.20 Let us pray. Lord, before this table and before these witnesses, we mutually pledge our spirits to you, as you have pledged your spirit to us. Hear our prayer, O Lord, and grant us your peace. In Jesus' name, amen.
Finally, we pledge our fortunes. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. Philippians 2, 5 and following. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Before the Incarnation, Jesus was equal with the Father in every respect. And he, along with the Father, was co-owner of all the wealth of the universe. But he emptied himself of equality with the Father in order to have equality with us. Before the Incarnation, apart from the Father, Jesus was the richest person in the universe. But, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, he pledged his fortune to us. Let us pray. Lord, before this table and before these witnesses, we mutually pledge our fortunes to you, as you have pledged your fortune to us. Hear our prayer, O Lord, and grant us your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. If we consecrate ourselves to the Lord, he will heal our land. Now, many of us here have been consecrated to the Lord for years. And I'm confident that God is at work in ways that we can't see. I'm confident that His handiwork in this nation will soon be made manifest to all men. Nevertheless, in the meantime, is there something more we can do? Yes. Of course there is. There's more we can do. What? Faith. Take action. Based on belief, sustained by confidence, in God. Well, what action? Do what? What do you suggest, Joe? Should we get better laws? Better regulations? Better punishment? Better enforcement? Better compliance? Better leaders? Better judges? I don't think that makes for better people. It hasn't historically. It certainly didn't work for God in the Old Testament to improve all of those things. That won't make our fellow citizens better people. A nation becomes a Christian nation not by virtue of Christians being squeaky wheels. A nation becomes a Christian nation by virtue of the degree to which its leaders and its citizens, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, mutually pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to that end. Do you want the United States to be a Christian nation? Then we need more Christians. Bottom line, plain and simple. The more Christians we have, the more people we'll have who are dedicating themselves to God, relying on divine providence, pledging and making good on their pledges for their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. And frankly, that's the answer to every societal ill that we have in this country. You want a more solid family structure in this nation? More lasting marriages? Less child abuse? Fewer abortions? More wholesome TV? Better entertainment choices? <laughs> we need more Christians. You want to have less uh, graft in this nation? Less corruption in our financial markets? Less abuse of power for profit? More concern for the general welfare in this nation? We need more Christians. Do you want a lower crime rate? 
fewer murders, fewer rapes, fewer robberies, fewer scandals among our public officials, then we need more Christians. You see, the Christian enterprise to spread the word isn't just about church growth. It's about the salvation of the world. And government of the people, for the people, by the people, will work a whale of a lot better when the people are holy. When the people have dedicated their lives to God. When the people are relying on the protection of divine providence. When the people submit themselves to God and mutually pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to God. How do we bring that about? First and foremost, by faithing. It's something we have to do. We have to take action based on belief sustained by confidence in God. Now, if you want to know more more about faithing, know more about what that entails, come back next week, and we'll talk more about what faithing entails. Until then, understand this. The founding of this nation was a human event that in some measure, to some degree, was undertaken deliberately following the model of another human event. The cross. Those who began this grand experiment did so with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence and so mutually pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to that end. And nothing short of that kind of consecration, nothing short of that kind of dedication of ourselves and our nation to God will bring us any closer to being a Christian nation. That's my message for today.